Well, good morning. I'm glad you could join us again here at the virtual dimension of the teaching ministry here at Living Springs as we are continuing through our series of studies on the principles or the elementary principles of Christ. And so um, let's get into it today as we always begin this series with Hebrews 6 verses 1 through 3. Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. So we pray and seek you, Lord, that indeed you would lead us through this, that you would bring your word to us in the demonstration and the power of your spirit, that your word be sown into our hearts to bring forth fruit, and that indeed, Lord God, we desire to go on as your word says. Amen. Let us go on to perfection. And we're talking again about going on from the point of being saved to completeness. In the fullness of all it is that God has always purposed, ordered, and provided for the new lives that we've been saved and regenerated in the life and the transforming power of God's Spirit to realize. Just as 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 and 18 tells us that if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And this is the part that I really like and I think really applies to this series of teachings. The word says, Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. I mean, there you have it. Now all things are of God, as opposed to the way they used to be, where all things were about us, of us, and for us, right? Okay, well, you know, nonetheless, we talk about all things being of God. There is a human or a physical dimension, really, to realizing the things of God in the course of our daily lives and fellowship. Physical ways through which we not only connect with, but share among one another the blessings of God's purpose, order, and provision for our lives as those he's redeemed as his own in Jesus Christ. Which, you know, it does it totally make sense considering the fact that God himself designed and created us specifically for this, our appointed place and time in this temporal life as spirit and soul residing in a temporary physical earthly body whereupon God's spirit really pleads with us if you will in Romans 12 verse 1 to therefore as a result this is the word of God to present your bodies that's right your bodies man a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your reasonable service or in other words, as an expression of true and spiritual worship, which again brings us back to the third elementary principle of Christ, the doctrine or the teaching of the laying on of hands. Talking about these hands that God has graciously and purposely designed and, and equipped us with. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 17, God issued this warning about what invariably happens, mind you, when someone God has chosen to bless begins to disregard the goodness, the grace, and the faithful provision of God, whereupon as a result, it, we're warned. Then you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gained for me or gotten me this wealth. My hand has gotten me all this stuff. Gotten me my wealth. Gotten me my positions. Gotten me my, my possessions. Gotten me my status. Gotten me recognition. It's, <laughs> sound familiar? It, 
it's an old voice from the past. Once again, that's that old sinful, selfish nature of the fallen man, the flesh that we all have to constantly reckon as having died with Christ. You know, that old man of the flesh that regards everything pretty much as being always and only about ourselves. And therefore, well, it views these hands of ours as a primary means by which we acquire stuff for ourselves. <laughs> Give me that. Ah, I want that. Ah, I'm working for that. Ah, I deserve that. Ah, you know? But the thing is, however, in our personal identification with Jesus, in his atoning death, victorious resurrection, talking now about saving faith, thereby seeing ourselves now as being in Jesus. Remember, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things, that old nature has passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and now all things are of God. Yeah, of God. It's what God, by his grace, would bestow upon us and pour into us. Have you ever stopped to consider what God then might freely and graciously do and provide through these hands he's given us for his glory and purpose, through loving service to others as testimony to what it actually means to truly be or to live as a new creation in Christ Jesus. You see, Jesus came, lived, served, and gave himself as a living example of what God can do through the selflessly yielded lives and hands of those who've been reconciled unto himself in Jesus. Now the thing I think that we all need to remember is when, and maybe you never thought of this, but you know, when we see Jesus in action, we read about it in the Gospels. When we see Jesus in action, we're not seeing Jesus. And he'd be the first one to tell you that. What we're really seeing is God, the Father, working his purpose in and through a wholly yielded human body similar to ours. Jesus took that body of flesh and blood upon himself in the incarnation. As Jesus himself testified in John chapter 5, verse 30, he said this, he said, I, I myself can do nothing. And offering the following example, he said, as I hear from the Father, I judge. And my judgment is righteous, meaning it's right. It's right, it's good. Because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Judge. Judge is essentially making a judgment call. It's about discerning. It's about, well, on what basis do we make the choices we make in life? And those choices then determine the things that we do in our lives and with our lives. And yes, with these hands. And so, you know, Jesus was saying basically that, hey, what I do has nothing to do with me. It's him. As I hear, I judge. I make these choices. These, I make these calls in life. And those things in my choices in life, the things that I do and say are right. They're right. Because Jesus said, and here's the key. And if you're wondering, well, how do I do what it is that is right in my life? That which is good, that which will bring forth fruit to the glory of God, that will lead me into the path of righteousness that my life might bear fruit. Well, the key is, Jesus himself said, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me, and that's why we need to be in to the word of God. Now, you know, when you get into the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 
you'll notice a number of recorded instances where Jesus laid his hands upon people. Some examples, I'm, I'm going to cite four of them, okay? In Mark chapter 8, verses 23 through 25, we read, it says, So he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of town, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him, he asked him if he saw anything, and he looked up and said, I see men like trees walking. Then he, Jesus, put his hands on his eyes again and made him look up, and he was restored and saw everyone clearly. In Matthew chapter 19, verses 13 through 15, we read, Then little children were brought to him that he might put his hands on them and pray. But the disciples rebuked them. They just wanted a touch from God. Jesus had to, was sent and begotten of the Father who came. They wanted him to lay hands and, and pray. And his disciples were like, hey, he doesn't have time for this. But Jesus said, see, this is how important this was. And it tells you something about laying hands on people. This was so important. Jesus was willing to stop where he was going, put everything else aside, and, and do this. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them. And then he departed from there. In Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 13, we read now, he was teaching Jesus in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and could in no way raise herself up. It was a spiritual thing. It, most of the time it's a physical issue. In this case, it was a spiritual. But when Jesus saw her, he saw her, he beheld her again. This is again the Lord just looking and seeing a need and he wants to deal with it. Jesus saw her and when he did, he called her to him and said to her, woman, you are loosed from your infirmity. So this is the purpose of God, to loose this woman from her infirmity. It says, and he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And you know, when Jesus returned to his hometown in Nazareth, we read in Mark chapter 6, verse 5, it says that now he could do no mighty work there. And we're not going to get into why that was. But it says, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And finally, Luke chapter 4, verses 40 through 41 we read, when the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons came out of many, crying out and saying, you are the Christ, the Son of God, and he rebuked them and didn't allow them to speak, for they knew he was the Christ. He laid hands on every one of them and healed them. And... Uh, those are only the instances recorded for us in the scriptures. I mean, who knows how many times and how many, for how many reasons Jesus was compelled by godly compassion and faithful obedience to the will and the leading of the Father to lay hands on people. He didn't do it on his own. Again, this is the leading of the Father. He's doing it in obedience to the will of God to lay hands on people as the conduit of God's grace and provision for their needs. As the Apostle John testifies in John chapter 21, verse 25, says, And there were also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose not even the whole world could contain the books that which it would be written. <clears throat> Thing is, you know, it's wonderful, right? Don't you wish you were there? Don't you wish Jesus was here? <laughs> uh, 
But the thing is, it was never supposed to end with Jesus when he ascended to the Father, as he himself made clear in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18 in your Bibles. He said, listen to this, and these signs will follow those who believe. It's not saying signs will follow those who believe in my name. He's saying that these signs will follow those who believe. And we obviously know that that's, that's you know, a place their faith, their hope, their destiny in Christ. They know that he is the Christ, the son of the living God. They know that he is the good shepherd. He's the one that they've turned from themselves and everything else to give themselves over to, and to love and to serve and to follow those who believe. He said, those who believe, he said, in my name, I'm going to repeat that, in my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Now, this particular passage has been misunderstood, misinterpreted, and, uh, you know, taken out of context many, many times. But, you know, when you think about it, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That just in and of itself, if you, that's all you do. We're talking about the what, what you're doing, and what will happen. And it is. That in itself is pretty amazing. I mean, thinking about that. <clears throat> If we lay hands on someone, doing so in the name of Jesus, and I repeat that again, doing it in the name of Jesus, that's the important thing. The Lord says they will be healed. In fact, in another passage, Jesus tells his 12 chosen apostles, he tells them, he says, and whatever you ask, whatever you ask, in my name, that I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Now notice the operative words here. I mean, it's great to ask God anything, whatever we ask. You know, I want a new car. I want a new house. I want more money in my bank account. I want those people to like me. I want a different job. Yeah, we go on and on. We list all these things. Yeah, anything, whatever. The great whatever, huh? <laughs> and so there are, you know, there are churches today. There are like the first church of the whatever. And, you know, but hey, the operative word here is, it all hinges on this. Jesus said, in my name, or as we would say it, in Jesus' name. So, you know, I've heard a lot of people use the name of Jesus. They think if I just say it, it's like magical. Poof, I'll have it. Just say it in Jesus' name. Like Jesus saying Jesus' name is like a, some kind of spiritual credit card, you know. You can get anything you want. Just say it in Jesus' name. That's, that's like magic. That's like, that's that whole business that we've talked about here before about God responding to us on the basis of the things we say and do. Well, God, I said in the name of Jesus, you're supposed to give me whatever I want. And there's people who preach that. And there's people who believe that. And it doesn't always work out so well. I have to, I, I learned that myself. Okay, so here's the deal. What's, what's he talking about? What does it mean? What's Jesus talking about? to speak or act in the name of another, in this case, in the name of Jesus. Well, saying and speaking and doing it, not saying it, he's talking about doing it, doing it in the name of another. Well, that distinguishes one who's serving as the faithful and obedient agent of that person. So they're, they're not doing their own thing. They're doing the business of the one who sent them, okay? The one, and 
that they've been authorized by that person to speak the words of that person, not their own words, but the words of that person, or act so as to carry out the will of that person, period. Now, it means, it really does what Jesus was talking about is something quite different from what a lot of people think. It's not about saying in the name of Jesus. It's a matter about what we do, about doing it in the name of Jesus. In fact, Jesus himself stands as the perfect example. You know, we have questions about how do we do things as Christians and how we're supposed to live and what do we do in this situation, how to handle it. And we, you know, I, I hear all these different voices with all these different ideas about do it this way and this way and that way. And maybe that's why we have so many different churches and denominations and stuff. I don't know. But look, from my point of view, <laughs> look, Jesus is the perfect example. I don't know why we don't just go to Jesus and see what he did, what he said, what he taught, how he lived, and focus on him. I mean, look, we know that Jesus came in his Father's name. In fact, Jesus himself said so to those who opposed him in John chapter 5, verse 43. He told them, he said, I have come in my Father's name. He went on to say, yeah, and you don't receive me. If another comes in his own name, in other words, somebody else doing his own thing, saying whatever he wants and this and that, you know, it's like, yeah, him you'll receive. But Jesus made it clear. He said, I've come in my Father's name. Now, what exactly was he saying? Well, here's what he was saying when he said, I've come in my Father's name. Jesus tells us in John chapter 6, verse 38, he said, for I have come from down from heaven. He said, listen to this, here we go again. Not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And if there was any question about what that meant, that sounds kind of like, wow, that's kind of, that's, that's heavy, man. Well, if you're not really sure what that means, it seems pretty clear to me. Well, in, in John chapter 5, verse 19, we read, it says, Then Jesus answered and said to them, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son, referring to himself, can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does... The Son also does in like manner. Remember what I said? When you see Jesus in action, you're not seeing Jesus in action. You're seeing God the Father working in and through the holy yielded body of a human, much like with a body like ours. And you know, the thing, when Jesus said, in John chapter 4, verse 34, my food, this is what keeps me going. This is what my life is about, he said. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Not my work, not my agenda, not my vision. It's not about my ambitions. You see what it means? to speak and to act in the name of another. <laughs> and you know, think about Jesus. He faithfully, selflessly, and unconditionally did so as the only begotten or sent of the Father for the purpose of saying and doing all that he the Father said and did. You know what that's called? It's called obedience. You know, and if you read the Faith Hall of Fame in Hebrews chapter 11, it talks all about faith and the testimony of those throughout the Old Testament who walked with God by faith and the things of God were accomplished in and through their lives by faith. You know, in the very first examples concerning Abraham, they, I mean, Abraham's life nails it. 
fact that it was done in obedience to the word of God. That is what faith looks like. It's not about saying the name of Jesus to get whatever we want, whatever we think. And so you see, that's it. You know, and then get a load of this. Following his resurrection, Jesus tells this to his followers. In John chapter 20, verse 21, so Jesus said to them again, peace to you. He said that to them when he first appeared in their midst. He said, peace to you, and here it comes. He says, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. Now you understand what it means to speak and to act in the name of Jesus? And we know then when they began to speak and act as the Holy Spirit spoke and acted through them, beginning in Acts chapter 2, the will and the work of the Father that had started through Jesus continued in the world and spread through they and other followers of Christ who likewise spoke and acted according to the will of God by the leading and the work of the Holy Spirit as he came and moved upon them as the lovingly yielded chosen agents of Jesus Christ. See, here's the deal. Simply saying in the name of Jesus doesn't make it so. It's all a matter of speaking and acting in the name of Jesus. As one who has been sent by Jesus to do the work of Jesus according to the will of the Father by the leading and work of his Spirit. Jesus told us in one verse, he said, apart from me, you, you can't do anything at least nothing of the purposes of God, and especially when it says that being new creations in Christ, now all things are of God. You want to see those things? Then you'd better start focusing on doing the will of God and the leading and the work of the Holy Spirit according to the light of God's word. And you know, you know, speaking in the name of Jesus is quite... A different thing, as I've said, from actually speaking and acting in the name of Jesus or speaking and acting according to the will of God. And face it, you know, that hasn't always been the case. I find in my own life, even when the stuff that we might want and expect, sometimes we said in the name of Jesus, and I, I hear it, you know, I. We, Somebody prays in the name of Jesus, claims something in the name of Jesus, rebukes something in the name of Jesus, you know. And sometimes it, it, it happens, and sometimes, most of the time it doesn't, you know. But when it does happen, because they, they said in the name of Jesus, you know, it could be something that we refer to as spiritual deception. Which, you know, I'm, I'm going to tell you, it's going to prove to be the ultimate undoing of many. On the day they stand before the Lord. We talked about this previously, where in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, Jesus warns. He said, Many, many, that, that, that says so much right there, many will say to me in that day when they stand before him in the judgment, Lord, Lord, have not have we not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? Now how do we know they weren't acting in the will of God? How do we know they weren't really speaking and acting in the name of Jesus, but were using his name? Just speaking his name, using it with some, some kind of spiritual credit card. Jesus continues, he says, and then I'll say, I'll declare to them, I, I never knew you. I have no idea who you guys are. I didn't send you. So, it, I mean, wow, that'll set you back, won't it? To go like, wow. Strangers, 
alienated? Jesus doesn't even know who these guys are. I never knew you. I didn't send you. And he goes, get out of here. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So yeah, those are two things in there we really need to pay attention to. Like I said, Jesus, when he tells them, I never knew you. I mean, he's saying, I, I never sent you to do those things. You weren't doing them on my account, by my direction, for my glory or my purpose. And he refers to them as you who practice lawlessness. In other words, this is what they were doing. They were doing their own thing. They were they were basically putting on their own show in order to show everyone and even the Lord hey look at me look what I did <sighs> scary huh so you know I leave you with this just keep living to love and serve Jesus Praying and laying hands on others as the conduit of God's work and provision. Knowing that there will be the times when you will speak and act in the name of Jesus. I'm not saying that you go around saying it, but you are actually doing it as he sent you to do it. He wills to do it in and through you. In other words, like I said, you're speaking and acting according to the Lord's will in that situation. Allowing the Holy Spirit to lead and work through you toward that end. And yeah, it, it's going to happen. Because Jesus said it would. Otherwise, look, don't sweat it if you're not seeing. You may be praying in the name of Jesus. You may be saying the name of Jesus. And it may not happen. Because you may not be actually working in the name and speaking as the chosen representative and the agent of the Lord for the purpose he wills to work and in and through you for that particular need. It may not be that case. It could be somebody else at a given time. But you, out of your love of your heart and your desire to serve others and to yield yourself to God, you go ahead and do it. It's all right. It's all right. Because God knows your heart. And that's why the Lord faithfully promises in Romans chapter 6, verses 28 and 27. Actually, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. Listen to this. I love this. Likewise, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, also helps in our weaknesses. You remember Jesus promised us, he said, If you love me, keep my word. I will pray the Father and he will send you another helper, even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, but you will know him because he lives with you, is with you and dwells in you. Remember Jesus said that when the spirit of truth comes, he will <clears throat> take what is mine and declare it to you. And then Jesus said regarding the Holy Spirit, he said, he, Jesus was saying essentially, I'm not going to leave you to yourselves. I won't leave you to yourselves. Jesus said, I'll come to you. Jesus comes to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. So yes, it's wonderful. He's called the helper. So likewise, Jesus said, or the Lord says in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. And listen to this. I think we can all identify with this. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. How many of you go to pray over a need or offer yourself to serve others in a need and even to step up and lay your hands on somebody, but you don't know the will of the Father in this? It happens to me all the time. My job, my calling, as well as yours, is simply to be a servant, just to present yourself. Just to offer yourself to serve others, to be the conduit. And maybe God will work through you, maybe he won't, maybe someone else. And he may work through you, but he may not work in ways that you, well, you might have thought that he should, or that others might expect. So anyway, again, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weakness, for we don't know what we should pray as we ought, but... <laughs> 
The Spirit himself makes intercession for us. He steps in before the throne of God in our place because we don't get it, but he does. And he says he makes intercession. In other words, he starts praying in our place before the throne of God, it says, with groanings which cannot be uttered. We're talking about words, utterances that the human, I mean, our own vocal cords aren't even capable of reproducing them, let alone our brains. There's nothing about us now. This is a totally heavenly thing that's going on here. And I love it because, you know, it goes on to say, now he who searches the hearts and knows what the mind of the spirit is, because there's a connection there's God and the Spirit now, because the Spirit is God. And a connection with the throne of God now is made. We're unable to do it, but he does it on our behalf. And it says, because he makes intercession for the saints. The saints are those who are in Christ. It says, according to the will of God. So you know, there's times when we don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray. We don't know what the will of God is. We see a need and we respond as the obedient servants of the Lord. And we even may be praying the way we think we should pray, the way we think it ought to be even. We may be praying for instant healing and for some miracle to happen but it's not the will of God to work it that way at that time. Well, the Spirit is interceding in our behalf. He steps in for us at the th before the throne of the Father. And he begins to pray according to the will of God. And you know what? It's a wonderful thing because he makes the connection to accomplish God's purpose and work. Not the way we might want it or somebody else might expect it, but he causes it to work in the time and the way that God has always wanted to do it in his will. And that's especially helpful. I think it's really significant and relevant in those many cases when, like I said, we're just human. We have no clue as to what the will of God is. But like I said, we're just simply and lovingly responding to the needs of others. Always Keeping in mind, okay, and this is the thing. Keeping in mind what God spoke to us through the prophet Isaiah. I'm going to close with this. Listen to this. The Lord says this. He said, for I am God and there's no other. That means we're not God. I don't know who we are thinking that we can go around telling God what to do. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, he wants us to know this, for I am God, I'm God, he says, and, and there's no other. He says, now he goes on, he goes, I am God and there, there is none like me. That's important to remember because uh, so oftentimes it's easy to think that God thinks like we do. That God sees things the way that we see them. You know, and we're like, yeah, well, this seems right to me. Okay, oh, God's got to go along with that. Look, in Isaiah chapter 55, he even says, God says, for my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are, are higher than your thoughts, even as the heavens are higher above the earth. So the Lord says, okay, get back to our passage here. He says, I am God, and there is none like me. So if you don't get it, Okay, that's all right. He's God, we're not. We don't oftentimes realize that when we should, but God always knows that we're just but dust. He gets it. Okay, so it's hard to get beyond this, isn't it? For I am God and there's none like me, but let's go on. He says, declaring the end from the beginning. So there's a purpose in everything from the beginning all the way to the end. God's got it all covered. It's already been eternally predetermined. It's all going to work out perfectly as he's determined. 
declaring the end from the beginning and, get this, from ancient times, things that are not yet. We're talking about things that are still yet to be in the future. That God has spoken of those things through his prophets thousands of years ago. Things that are not yet done. And this is a thing that, you know, when you read the book, of, when you read the prophet Isaiah, you really pick up on this because he brings it to us. The Lord lays this down. He throws down the gauntlet. Here it is. So the way it is. Saying, my counsel, this is God speaking. He says, my counsel shall stand. And I will do all my pleasure. And then he says this, calling a bird of prey from the east, and he was speaking about an individual. He says, the man who executes my counsel, even from a far country. Now that's somebody who is speaking and acting in the Lord's name. The man who executes my counsel from a far country. Because the Lord just says it again. Indeed, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will do it. See, these are the things that God does. The things that he has spoken. The things that he has purposed. Always keep that in mind when you are praying. We seek to act and to speak in the name of Jesus. And like I said, sometimes we get it and sometimes we don't. And sometimes we're not even the chosen instrument in the vessel. We just step in because we want to serve. But know this, that what it is that God has spoken and what he has purposed, he will do. And when we are that person who obediently yielded to the leading of the Holy Spirit, does indeed speak and act. We are doing so, not saying it, we're doing it in the name of Jesus. As his agent, representative, instrument. That's what our bodies are. They should be his instruments. And these hands, the conduits of his blessing and his power. Well, just like the Lord said, I will do it. I will do it. So in closing today, I would just say, look, don't freak out. Don't sweat it. We're just human. And God totally gets that. I think he, he, under, he knows that better than even we do. We're the ones who lose sight of that fact. So just love and serve for the glory and the testimony of Jesus. Give yourself to him. Say, here I am, Lord, use me for your glory, for your purpose, not so I can go around telling everybody, hey, look what I did, okay? And, um, you know, if you get it right, if you're right there and he's there, the connection happens, great. But know this, that it's all right, even if you're not. The Holy Spirit makes things happen. He intercedes on our behalf and know that the things that God has always purposed, it's all right. In spite of us, he gets it done. He gets it done.